Ladies and gentlemen, before you listen to this podcast, I'm going to do a rare thing. I want you to take a look at this photo from the 19, late 1950s of this young gentleman and think to yourself, who was he? Was he a, a Boy Scout? Was he a hockey player? Was he a, a volunteer for a local Protestant or Catholic church? Was he a, a high school student? Was he, you know, a, a teen idol? Ladies and gentlemen, this gentleman you're looking at, Stephen Truscott, our federal court system put him on death row when he was 14 years old in the greatest miscarriage of justice in modern legal history. It's a disgrace what was done to Stephen, and suffice it to say, his case caused the death penalty in Canada directly to be overturned, created the Young Offenders Act, which protected young offenders, uh, led to the constitutional rights of uh, those accused, and helped us to understand we couldn't live in the 1950s, uh, what do you call, uh, legal quagmire mentality, we had to be modern. <clears throat> now, Stephen Murray Truscott is a Canadian man born January 18, 1945, who was wrongly convicted and sentenced to death in 1959 for rape and murder of classmate Lynn, Lynn Harper, who had connections at the time to New Brunswick. Truscott had been the last known person to see her alive. He was scheduled to be hanged. However, the federal uh, cabinet under, uh, uh, the, if I'm not mistaken, the liberals, reprieved him and he was sentenced to life in prison and released on parole in 1969. Five decades later, in 2007, his conviction was overturned on the basis that key DNA or forensic evidence was weaker than had been portrayed at trial. Again, he is the youngest person in Canada to ever face execution and probably, probably, uh, in North American history. Uh, I, I don't have all the details, but I know of many 14-year-old kids who are on death row in the States. Now, Sherilyn Harper was born to Leslie and Shirley Harper on August 31st, 1946 in New Brunswick. She had only one, only one older brother, Barry Harper, who lived in Ohio, and a younger brother, Jeffrey. Her fa his father was a school teacher. Her father was a school teacher before he joined the military in 1940. He relocated to the RCAF base at Clinton in July '57, and Lynn uh, was very active in her Sunday school Bible class and Girl Guides. Now, on June 9, 59, Lynn, then 12 disappeared near RCF station at Clinton, an Air Force base out of Clinton, Ontario, what is now Vanastra, roughly 80 kilometers north of London, Ontario. Two days later, on the afternoon of June 11th, searchers discovered her body in a nearby farm woodlot. Harper had been raped and had been strangled with her own blouse. Now, Truscott and Harper had been classmates in a combined 78 class, grade 78 class, at the Air Vice Marshal U. Campbell School, located on the north side of the Air Force base. In the early evening of Tuesday, June 9th, Truscott had given Harper a ride on the crossbar of his bicycle and proceeded from the vicinity of the school northwards along the county road. The timing and duration of their encounter and what happened while they were together has been a contention issue since 1959. Members of the Harper family believe that Truscott is the murderer, while Truscott has vehemently denied he was even involved in any iota of the case. In court, the Crown contended that Truscott and Harbour left the county road before reaching the bridge over the Bayfield River, and in a wooden area besides the county road, known as Austin Bush, Truscott raped and murdered Lynn. Lynn. Truscott had maintained since 59 that he took Harper to the intersection of the county road and Highway 8, where he left her unharmed. Truscott maintains that when he arrived at the bridge, he looked back towards the intersection where he had dropped Harper off and observed that a vehicle had stopped and that she was in the process of entering it. On June 10, 59, at 9.30 a.m., Stephen was interviewed by Constable Hobbs and a cruiser at the school. He told Hobbs that while standing on the bridge, he saw Lynn get into a late model Chevrolet and there was a lot of chrome on the car and it could have been a Bel Air version. Uh, at 11.20 that evening, Lynn's father reported her missing. Now on June 12, shortly after 7 p.m., Truscott was taken to custody. At about 2.30 a.m. on June 13, after being interrogated for numerous hours without counsel, he was charged with first-degree murder under provisions of the Juvenile Delinquents Act. 
On June 30, Truscott was ordered to be tried as an adult, and appeal that that order was dismissed. Now, at the time, ladies and gentlemen, there was no charter. There was really, uh, under jurisdictions in Ontario and Quebec and the Maritimes, it was the local constabulary that made the rules. There was no federal system like we have now. Uh, the Court of King's Bench and Queen's Bench and the RCMP has a more conciliatory or cooperative approach. Now, on September 3rd, 16th, Truscott's trial began in the then Supreme Court of Ontario in Godrich before Justice Ferguson and a jury. Truscott was represented by Frank Donnelly. Glenn Hayes appeared for the Crown. All the evidence presented in court against the accused were circumstantial and centered on placing Harper's death within a narrow time frame, which implicated uh, Truscott. Key to his uh, narrow, this narrow window was the autopsy's uh, doctor's testimony that the decomposition of Lynn's body in a state of partially digested food and her stomach indicated she had died near the precise time she was acknowledged to have been with Truscott. On September 30th, the jury returned a verdict of guilty with a recommendation for mercy. However, Justice Ferguson then sentenced Truscott to death by hanging. Just a few months uh, after uh, Harper's death, on January 20th, 1960, Truscott's appeal, put forth by John G. J. O'Driscoll to the Court of Appeal for Ontario, was dismissed. Immediately afterwards, the government of Canada commuted Truscott's sentence to life imprisonment. An application for leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada was denied on February 24th. On that date, Truscott did not have an automatic right to appeal to this court. Now, from his arrest until the commutation of his death sentence, he was imprisoned at the Huron County Jail in Godrich, a 15-year-old in jail with, with dangerous criminals from, from then on. After the commutation of his sentence, he was transferred to the Kingston Penitentiary, even worse for assessment, and he was incarcerated at the Ontario Training School for Boys in Guelph from February 60 to January 63. <coughs> On January 14, 63, he was transferred to Collins Bay Penitentiary. Truscott was eventually transferred on May 7, 67, to the farm annex of Collins Bay Independent Penitentiary, and on October 21, 69, he was released on parole and lived in Kingston with his parole officer and then in Vancouver for a brief period before settling in Guelph under an assumed name. He married and raised three children. Now, on November 12, 74, Truscott was relieved at the terms and conditions of his parole by the National Parole Board. Now, Truscott's case was the focus of considerable public attention. In early 66, Isabelle Lou Le Boudrier argued in the trial of Stephen Truscott that Truscott had been convicted of a crime he did not commit, rekindling public debate and interest in the case. On April 26, 66, the government of Canada referred the Truscott case to the Supreme Court. Five days of evidence were heard by the Supreme Court, followed by submissions in January 67. That evidence included the testimony of Truscott, who had not testified at the 59 trial. British pathologist Professor Keith Simpson was invited by the Canadian government to review the forensic evidence. On May 4, 67, the Supreme Court, Hall J. dissenting, held that if Truscott's appeal had been heard by the court, it would have been dismissed. In 1967, uh, new forensic evidence was presented on his behalf, and Truscott testified before the Supreme Court, telling his story for the first time. Truscott and 25 other witnesses testified before the court. After a two-week hearing before the Supreme Court, uh, Canada's top judges again ruled 6-1 against Truscott getting a new trial, and he was returned to prison to serve the remainder of his sentence. The Supreme Court stated there were many incredi incredibilities inherent in the evidence given by Truscott before us, and we do not believe his testimony. The joint operation of Canada's Supreme Court justices was the verdict of the jury read in the light of the charge of the trial judge makes it clear that they were satisfied behind a reasonable doubt uh, that the facts, which he found to be established by the evidence which they accepted, were not only consistent with the guilt of Truscott, but were inconsistent with any rational conclusion other than the, the, the facts Stephen Truscott was guilty. Now, Truscott maintained a low profile until 2000, when an interview on CBC television investigative news program, The Fifth Estate, revived interest in the case. Together with a subsequent book by journalist Julius Scherr, he suggested that evidence in favor of Truscott's innocence had been ignored in the original trial. Now, the main suspect of the Harper murder, I don't want to go too deep into it to give any uh, dissuasion of the evidence I'm presenting. 
Suffice it to say, it's in public domain. I want you uh, to come from this podcast and to do more research on the Truscott case. It's very interesting. There were some allegations that a chronic uh, pedophile or molester may have killed Harper. Now, on November 28, uh, 2001, uh, legal uh, mind James Lockyer led the Association Defense of the Wrongly Convicted to file an appeal to have the case reopened. On January 21, 24, 2002, retired Justice Fred Kaufman was appointed by the federal government to review the case. On October 28, 2004, Justice Minister Erwin Kotler directed a reference pursuant to Section 693.3A2 of the Criminal Court to the Code of Appeal of Ontario to review whether the new evidence would have changed the 59 verdict. On April 6, 2006, uh, the body of Lynn Harper was exhumed by order of the Attorney General of Ontario in order to test for DNA evidence. There was hope that it was to bring some closure to the case, but no usable DNA was recovered from the remains. Now, blowflies, maggots, and insect activity in Harper's body were capable of raising a reasonable di- doubt whether she died before 8 p.m. It could just suggest she died as late as the next day, although the court said there was no realistic possibility that entomology could have assisted in solving the murder in 1959. However, samples of insects and maggots were collected from the body at the time and the scientists involved. By knowing uh, when insects deposit their eggs or larvae in a corpse, es- expert can estimate time of death. The evidence did not rule out that Lynn died at the time stated by the Crown. Now, Truscott's conviction was brought to the Court of Appeal for Ontario on June 19, 2006. The five-judge panel, headed by Ontario Chief Justice McMurtry and including Justice Michael Moldavar heard three weeks of testimony and fresh evidence. On January 31, 2007, the Court of Appeal from Ontario began hearing arguments from Truscott's defense in the appeal of Truscott's conviction. Arguments were heard by the court over a period of 10 days, concluding on February 10. In addition to the notoriety of the case itself, the hearing is also notable for being the first time that cameras were allowed into a hearing of the Court of Appeal of Ontario. Now, the Court of Appeal heard evidence, including earlier versions of draft autopsy reports, that contradicted the supposed narrow window for Lynn's time of death. Pathologist Dr. John Penniston had in fact provided three different estimates for the time period, the first two of which would have excluded Truscott as a suspect. Only after the police had narrowed on Truscott as a prime suspect did Penniston provide forensic proof that Lynn had died exactly around the time that implicated Truscott. His original estimates and draft autopsy reports were concealed from the defense in the court. Now, during the review, Justice Moldovar asked retired OPP officer Harry Hanks Sayo, who assisted Inspector Harold Graham, why the police never considered a sexual psychopath might be responsible for Lynn's rape and murder before the narrative focus on a 14 year old. Did the thought ever cross your mind for someone to strangle her and sexually assault her? You might want to be looking for someone who was more of a pervert, more of a sexual psychopath? I don't recall that, said the 84 year old Sayo. Now, on August 28, 2007, the Court of Appeal acquitted Truscott of the charges. Truscott's defense team had originally asked for a declaration of factual innocence, which meant that Truscott would be declared innocent and not merely unable to be found guilty be found beyond a reasonable doubt. Although he issued a acquittal, the court said it was not in the position to declare Truscott's innocent of the crime. The appellant has not demonstrated his factual innocence, the court wrote. And this is what? 50 years after the case almost, at this time and on the totality of the record, we are in no position to make a declaration of innocence. Within the court's 2006 judgment, as they reviewed the evidence against Truscott, the court wrote that in these circumstances, we cannot say that an acquittal is the only reasonable verdict. Now, Attorney General of Ontario Michael Bryant apologized to Truscott on behalf of the provincial government, stating they were truly sorry for the miscarriage of justice. However, Many, including Harper's family, have never thought that Truscott was innocent of the murder. And in July 2008, Harper's brother described Truscott's compensation package uh, for the, uh, uh, the victim rights as a real travesty, indicating he would inform their father, not inform their father, for fear the news would upset him. Now, retired U.S. Marshal Mark McClish argues in Chapter 16 of the 2001 book, I Know You're Lying, Detecting Deception Through Statement Analysis, that analysis of Truscott's statement suggests he is guilty. In his statement published in a 71 book, Truscott says he hopes for an appeal, a new trial, even an acquittal. 
McClish points out that an innocent person sitting on death row would hope that the person who killed Lynn Harper was caught, and that it never crosses Truscott's mind that the best thing would be for the killer to be found because he knows he killed Lynn Harper. Now, here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. Truscott, even in modern day, is a very soft-spoken individual. And the thing is, there was an aspect in the Fifth Estate documentary as well that there was a stubbornness about him that basically he didn't want to let on what he was really thinking. Now, uh, our great author, Anne McDonald's 2003 novel, The Way to Crow Flies, is also based on a fictionalized version of the Truscott case and the surrounding community's reaction to the incident. McDonald himself herself was raised in the same region during the same period as the Truscott case. Now, in protest of the harsh sentence, notable Canadian writer Pierre Burton wrote a poem, Requiem for a 14-year-old, which drew up heavy controversy across Canada. Some people said it was self-serving, other people said it was just triacal. But this is still Pierre Burton. Now, Canadian rock band Blue Rodeo also recorded the song Truscott, which referenced the case on their 2000 album, The Days in Between. Now, the big controversy on the CBC was the coverage of the case. Laurie Lapierre, uh, the McGill uh, educator and co-host of the great classic CBC news show This Hour of Seven Days, was eventually fired after shedding a tear in response to an interview with Truscott's mother, Doris. La- Lapierre's reaction? Quickly wiping away tears <coughs> under one eye and, and speaking in a, in a shaky voice, infuriated CBC President Alphonse Humet. Uh, the president, already a critic of seven days, took it as proof that La- Lapierre was unprofessional. The popular show was canceled, and the other co-host, Patrick Watson, was also fired over the incident. Now, a uh, award-winning play called Innocent's Loss, written by Beverly Cooper and based on Truscott's conviction, was featured at the Blight Festival Theatre in Blight, Ontario, during the summer of 2008. It was a finalist for the Governor General's Award for English Language Drama that year. The play was remounted again in the company's 2009 season, and it was again playing in 2013 in various Ontario localities, including Toronto, Ottawa, and the London Community Players in London, Ontario. Its Western Canadian premiere was at Langara College of Studio 58 in 2014. And of course, the most chilling scene is Stephen giving a ride to Harper on the bike. Now, The 2020 film Marlene tells the story of the Stephen Truscott case as Stephen Truscott, played by Greg Burke, and how his wife Marlene Truscott, played by Kristen Booth, worked tirelessly to clear her husband's name by exposing lies, cover-ups, and police mishandling of the case. Now, as Canadians, we're proud of many things. But before... True to arrive, and I'm not talking about Justin, I'm talking Pierre Arrive. Canada was not a country of uh, human rights. It was still a work in progress. We weren't really focused as a country until the Constitution came down in 82 with the Charter. There was many miscarriages of justice even into the 1990s. Guy Paul Morin, the Donald Marshall case, uh, Jackie Vautour, although he wasn't a murdering a murderer, it was, his case was mishandled like crazy. There was case and case upon case upon case that were wrong. But for a country as supposedly Christian as Canada was in the late 1950s, to put a 14-year-old child on death row because he was being verbally tortured in an interview room for approximately 7 to 14 hours at various there's different people. But he was there with no counsel, no breaks, and he wasn't even understanding what he was saying. How deep of a country were we our own lack of lack of uh, compassion for young people to allow this to happen. Do you think in 2022, you look at a situation in Iran where they're executing people in the states for protesting. We were no better than the Iranians are in the last couple of weeks by putting Stephen Truscott on trial Can you and uh, convicting him. Can you imagine a 14-year-old being led to the gallows? What did it, what it have done to the modern Canadian people? That could have changed legal history Maybe if people demanded, more people demanded for his execution, maybe uh, capital punishment would not be taken off the books. All I know is this, ladies and gentlemen. The case of the last two executions in Toronto, the case of the what they call the Mad Bomber, who had led to the last female execution in Canada, the Joe Richard case, my distant cousin up North Shore. There are certain people deserve to be, to be executed. 
I don't believe in capital punishment. When I say deserve, if the law says they've done the crime, they have to do the time. But Stephen Truscott, all he did bad was maybe have a little of attraction as a 14-year-old boy to a 12-year-old girl, which we all had growing up. He gave her a ride just to... How you used to impress girls when I was growing up? It was your CCM or Schwinn, or you bought him a Coke or a Pepsi at a convenience store. If that person ended up dead seven hours later, if that would happen to North Shore, would that person who bought the pop for the person disappeared be uh, be uh, put on death row with circumstantial evidence? Of course not. They're out to, to, to hide something. There's something happened with, within that, uh, that, uh, that uh, forces base involving the cops, and there's allegations in the Fifth Estate, I don't want to get into it because I don't want to be sued, but there's a certain suspect that's talking about in the uh, in the Fifth Estate documentary, and there's much on the Truscott cases on there. Now, not to be critical here, but the sensationalism of the Jeffrey Dahmer case in recent uh, months, the Golden Globe nominations, that's a disgrace. What you really need to do is sensationalize the Stephen Truscott case to remind Canadians that if we take our eye off the prize and uh, go for the frontier justice that Truscott was put in, for Christ's sake, ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Truscott, Truscott used to look like me a little bit when I was a kid. When I first saw that photo, when I started studying the case, I said, Jesus Christ, that could have been me. It could have been anybody. Somebody from Halifax, somebody from uh, you know, southern Quebec, uh, somebody from Manitoba. Like guilt, uh, guilt by association is not a is not a uh, is not a criminal charge. Did he say? Uh, did he say maybe he had touched her? Because there were some allegations that he said on an investigation that he thought he may have uh, molested her. Whatever that means, I don't know. If you're being uh, being uh, queried twelve hours, you're going to lose your mind too. No, no, uh, no rest breaks, no bathroom breaks. The kid was scared, but where were his family in all this? Where were his family defending his rights? Where was the media? 1958, like I said, it was just a Canada that wasn't fully developed. You know, that's the way it goes. I think Stephen Truscott is, is innocent, is what I'm saying. Anybody thinks he's guilty, uh, please leave my channel because. If you think he's guilty, my God, you don't know anything about how to investigate or to judge evidence. Because what was her intent? What was his intent? Why would he want to harm her? That's kind of obvious to put a kid on a bike and take her in the woods and rape her. It, was he physically strong enough to do that? That's one question that never came up at trial. Was he physically strong enough to knock out a girl and then, you know, and a lot of people felt she died the next day. Was her body dumped? What she picked up and her body was dumped back because maybe the guy saw Truscott and her on the bike. Nobody thought about that. Anyway, it never ends. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're liking what we're doing, we're a true crime podcast, especially the Canadian uh, uh, penal code in relation to executions, let us know with a like, comment, or subscribe. And God bless Canada, but my God, we had a lot of growing up to do after that bad summer of the summer of Truscott, we're calling it. Thanks for listening.